All right, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to be talking about deploying Kubernetes uh, in a secure-ish way. Uh, and we're going to be talking about like the under the Kubernetes stuff and the Kubernetes install itself. So if you're here to learn about how to like run an application secure on, securely on Kubernetes, this isn't that talk. Uh, and so if it's not what you're here for, feel free to leave. We won't be offended. Uh, my name is Paul Tchaikovsky. I am a, uh, a dev advocate at uh, Pivotal. Uh, and I talk about Kubernetes and DevOps and operations and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, so my name is Major Hayden. Uh, I work at Rackspace, and a lot of my focus is around uh, deploying OpenStack clouds and deploying Kubernetes on top of it uh, and trying to do all of that in a secure, documented way. And so we'll kick this off. This is what it feels like when you go to KubeCon. Uh, you kind of feel like, oh, man, the sun is rising. The fog is starting to clear. Maybe the fog is like a bad outage or operational problems or things like that. Uh, but you just have that feeling of euphoria, like things are maybe going to get better. Like how many went and saw Kelsey's uh, keynote this morning? I felt like things were awesome after that. I, I wasn't entirely sure what he did, but it was really exciting. And so this is what it's like when you're back at the office and you talk to your friends and coworkers about uh, what you saw at KubeCon. You're like, man, you, you'd be amazed by this. Look at all this cool technology we've got. We can deploy our applications in a better way than we did before. It's really exciting. Um, and then once you decide, hey, maybe we should try to use some of that internally, um, then you end up having a conversation with your corporate security team, and it looks a little bit more like this. So there's no natural lighting in this room. How many people like Breaking Bad? All right, this is a, it's a really fun show. But yeah, I know, when you go and talk to the corporate security team, all the excitement and everything from the way you provision, um, the way you operate, everything kind of falls flat because the security team is not interested in what you're talking about. Do, do, do we have anyone from the corporate security team here? All right, I'm cool. a former corporate security team yeah. member myself, so I know how this feels. I've been on both sides of that table. So really what it comes down to is uh, enterprise security teams care about a small subset of things. And if you boil it down, they want changes that are not going to get in the way, have some kind of value, that are well documented, that they can actually go back and audit, or you can audit and provide proof of compliance, and that are easily understood. When you go into a corporate security team and say, oh, we've got this replication controller that you know, takes care of this, this, and that, they don't hear any of that. But if you say, hey, you're concerned about availability, right? The security team says, yes, you know, the, it must be up all the time. OK, well, we have a system that makes sure we have X amount of copies available at all times, and here's how our networking is set up. You kind of have to learn to speak their language. And so really what you want to do is find a way to get here. So if you're already doing DevOps and you're looking at automating your infrastructure, whether that's Kubernetes or OpenStack or Cloud Foundry or whatever have you, um, you want to balance that with security. You want to find some way to make that relatable for your security team. And so to do this, you have to push back on your security team a little bit and ask for what the guardrails are. So a lot of times, when you have those interactions with your security team, it feels like you hit a roadblock, like they're just constantly throwing things up that you have to jump over or break through. But it, if you've ever heard of that concept of managing your manager, you know, help your manager understand what you need, it's the same way with a corporate security team. And say, hey, look, what you're giving me are roadblocks. Give me guardrails. Show me where I cannot go. Tell me where the edges are, and then I'll make sure I stay in the middle of that path. You'll find over time uh, that most corporate security teams will start to expand those guardrails out a little bit. And so a quick public service announcement, uh, always enable Linux security modules in your container deployments. I went to a talk yesterday and someone said AppArmor was giving us trouble, so we turned it off. <laughs> Don't. Um, so seriously, stop disabling SE Linux. If you go to stop disabling selinux.com, there's some more information you can review there. I'm surprised you're not wearing your set and force shirt. No, I didn't, I didn't wear the shirt today. It's, I've worn it so many times, it's gotten pretty ragged. Um, so luckily there's a lot of tools that can help with these challenges. And one of the ones that we both use on a regular basis is Ansible. So how many people have used Ansible in here before? Oh, fantastic. Right. This is going to be a review for some of us, so we'll go pretty quick. So Ansible does everything from uh, deploying your software, restarting services, uh, installing packages, running commands, changing config files, you name it, it'll take care of it. Uh, if you've never seen Ansible before, I'll explain it in three bullets. You have tasks. They each do one thing. Maybe change a config file, restart a service clone something from Git. Uh, then you take all those tasks and you group them together in a role. And you say, hey, I have a web server. And a web server has these set of tasks. And then finally you say, OK, well, I'm going to write a playbook that deploys my web servers and then my database servers and then maybe something else. Uh, and so you group those roles together in a playbook. And so that's essentially Ansible explained in a, in a quick minute. 
And why we love Ansible is that it's simple. Everything's written in YAML. It's very easy to read top down. Uh, even for security teams, they can take that apart and understand it. There's not a whole lot of code and markup and craziness to understand. The inventory system is very easy. Uh, if you can understand flat files or JSON, you should be fine. It's also very versatile. You can use it on containers. You can use it in VMs. You can use it to make your containers. Um, you don't need any daemons installed in your nodes. There's not a security concern around uh, as soon as you go to your corporate security team and say, I'm going to run a, da uh, a daemon on every node, you'll watch them start to get nervous. They want to know how it's configured, who has access to it. And then finally, it's repeatable. So you can run a playbook over and over and over and over again, and you'll get the same results. Um, so this is also handy when your corporate security team comes knocking and they say, hey, are you doing all the things you said you were doing? You could just run the playbook right in front of them and say, see, nothing changed. Everything is, is applied. And so auditing becomes very easy. It also has an auditing system and like a dry run capability so that maybe you come to a new system and you want to know what Ansible is going to do on it. You can just run it in check mode and Ansible will say, hey, look, you asked me to do 50 things. 40 of these are already complete or I don't need to take action, but these 10 I need to take action on. Yeah, and so this is what a, uh, an Ansible, a very basic Ansible playbook looks like. Uh, and this is kind of a pattern that we use a lot. Um, uh, it's basically install a package, run a template to configure it, and then make sure it's started or restarted if that template changes. Um, and we, we've done a ton of Ansible, and we've done a lot of complicated, stupid things with Ansible, and we keep finding ourselves trying to simplify it back to this and making it super readable, super easy for anyone to pick up and understand. You know, even like the, the NOC team at like 3 a.m., if they can read, understand, and run a playbook, they don't have to r wake me up because I thought I was being smart and added in a bunch of logic that wasn't really necessary. Um, so this kind of pattern of these three tasks, like per thing you're d deploying, is, is uh, super powerful and you don't n normally need to do a ton more. Um, and then you can do other stuff. You, you, can, uh, you can, what am I doing here? Oh yeah, you can configure uh, Cisco switches uh, and other, other switches, which is really cool, right? So you can work with your security team and actually like, I need to change into this v VLAN and set my MTU down so I can pixie boot. Well, we can actually do that straight from Ansible and then uh, it, it just works and we're all happy. Uh, you can deploy cloud instances. So this is deploying uh, some Google compute instances and it's using variables that are pulled from an inventory, which is like a, a big YAML uh, dictionary of uh, values and, and settings. So I can like, this will actually loop over like an array and like I can say I want 15 VMs with these settings and we'll go and, and do that. This is an instance where you start to add a little bit of complexity to, to Ansible and you maybe lose a little bit of readability, but you get a little, it's that extra functionality that makes it worth it. Uh, and then you can do really complex stuff uh, like pixie booting servers and it'll go through and do like your IPMI commands to reboot, drop files in the right place, delete them once it's rebooted and all that sort of stuff. So you can get very, very hands off from like doing pretty much anything you need to deploy bare metal cloud from the infrastructure to the network to the software, you can basically do it all with Ansible. Uh, and then there's uh, Ansible Tower is, uh, I, think, I think they have an open source version now, but it's a commercial product from uh, Red Hat. Uh, I don't use it myself, um, but for large orgs um, that need a little bit of extra access control and also maybe need a knock that has buttons that they can press to run uh, tasks and you can also join several playbooks together and several roles together using it in like a, like a pipeline workflow and stuff like that. Uh, and it has a bunch of like uh, visibility into what's going on. Uh, so a lot of people do find it useful. And so we've talked a little bit about Ansible and kind of given an overview and some of the things that you could do or even give your security team access to run for you. So one of these things that, uh, that we've worked hard on is uh, Ansible hardening. And so it's an it's a Ansible role that you can go and apply to any server. Uh, it got its start within the realm of OpenStack. And then we asked the question of why couldn't we just do this on any host? Then we expanded into that. Um, and then finally someone actually came to the IRC channel and says, well, have you done this on a Kubernetes host? And we said, well, shoot, we haven't done that. And so we went and tried it. And after a couple of tweaks, it actually worked fine there as well. Uh, so we've had a couple of folks who have come by and used um, uh, projects like Cube Spray, which we'll get to in a little bit. Uh, and then they've said, hey, like I've just run Ansible hardening with that and it just worked. Um, so what you get from Ansible hardening is it takes the uh, se um, security uh, technology, or why can't I? Security technical implementation guide, STIG, from the federal government. 
that provides you a whole bunch of security hardening configurations for your system, and it applies that. However, it does it in a more sensible way where um, the changes that would cause uh, significant problems within your environment are disabled, and you can go and enable them if you need to. Or, for example, if a 15-minute timeout is too tight for you, you could expand it. Or if you want to tighten it down to, to five minutes, you could. Um, so certain things like disabling IPv6 uh, in my uh, Kubernetes and OpenStack environment, that would cause problems. Uh, so you could, that is disabled by default. And so you can actually um, go and apply this. If you use Ansible on a regular basis, we are looking for contributors. So feel free to jump in. Yeah, and then so while, uh, while Major was working on that, I was kind of working on the other side using this tool called Inspec, which uh, it's a fairly simple uh, DSL that lets you uh, describe how a system should look, and then it goes and checks if that system looks the way you want. So like the Stig says that Etsy password shouldn't be, re should be, shouldn't be writable by anyone but root. And so you can say to Inspec, hey, make sure Etsy password is only writable by root. And it will do that, and it will you know, validate it and it will say everything's good or it'll say it's, everything's bad. Uh, and the reason, uh, the reason I, I got into Inspec was uh, when, we, when I joined uh, IBM through acquisition, we worked with the security team, and this is, this is how we would check that a system matched the uh, IBM comp compliance guidelines. We had these Excel sheets that were like thousands upon thousands of lines of settings, and people would go through and would like log into every server and go through this checklist in Excel and make sure they're all done. And I kind of, I made fun of them for a little bit. And, uh, and then I realized that actually my job there was to help them. So I had to stop making fun of them and actually help them. Uh, and that's where I got into Inspec. I'm like, hey guys, this is, this is pretty cool. We can go from, we can take all of your rules in these Excel spreadsheets and we can write them in a fairly simple DSL, which looks like this. And then our monitoring software, Sensu, can, can run this like once a day or once an hour, or however often. And then you'll actually wake me up when my servers go out of uh, security compliance, and I'll fix it, or Ansible will fix it, actually. Uh, and so we worked with them a lot, and actually the security team basically took on all of that work and wrote all the, all the inspect rules and uh, we, we ended up being a really good, strong partner with me, which I was super, super happy about. Um, and then... Uh, in, installing it with installing Stig rules, not Stig rules, uh, inspect rules with Ansible is super easy. Um, you can just kind of git clone a repo of, of, the, of the Stig rules, and we actually have up on a, a git repo all of the rules to, infor to audit basically your Stig settings. Uh, and then, so when we got to, got to this point, I sort of saw the security hardening bit, and we're like, oh, we can use security hardening combined with this, combined with our own playbooks, and suddenly we have a method to secure our servers, and also a method to audit our servers. Um, and yeah, so we had Sensu was monitoring it, so we'd get alerts. And also, uh, because we had a centralized logging service, um, like once a day, we had a report in our logging service of what all servers were compliant and what weren't. And so like all of that auditing and comp uh, compliance and auditing and checking just magically became automated uh, and saved a, a ton of time and allowed those folks that were keyboard warriors before to actually work on things that were adding a lot more value than just manually checking uh, files on servers. Um, and then another thing we worked on uh, was called uh, Cuddle, uh, which was uh, originally called Site Controller. And that was basically all the other bits to give us a, a fairly secure environment, fairly secure infrastructure. So it was a SSH bastion that had uh, two-factor authentication and some uh, role-based role access. Uh, it gave us an OAuth web portal, uh, and it gave us our centralized logging, monitoring, uh, and a, bu a bunch of other stuff. Uh, we open sourced it, uh, and it's actually just a, a big monolithic Ansible repo that installs Sensu, Logstash, sets up the Bastion, um, and, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and it kind of looks like this. Um, I don't really need to go through the architecture, but it kind of um, you can just kind of run it locally, or it can spread out, and you can VPN between, and it forms like a like a, a mesh, and you have like one central dashboard to go across maybe 30 data centers, which is what we had. Uh, it was super useful because it meant the operations team, the security team doing the auditing, just went to one place, and they could see all of our infrastructure spread across uh, you know 30 data centers, and like they had one bastion host they needed to remember that could get them to any SSH into any server. They had 
one web host that remembered it and they could get to like the logs or monitoring or whatever for any of the servers. Um, and that's what the dashboard looked like. Um, listed listed the, um, the data centers and the uh, services that were enabled to look up there. And then it had, you know, Uchiwa for Sensu, it had Grafana, uh, it had net data for each server, a bunch of that sort of stuff. Uh, the Bastion, so uh, had, uh, has two-factor authentication for SSH, uh, either YubiKeys pressing that button or uh, the Google Authenticator. Um, and it has a couple of tools that we open source called SSH Agent Proxy uh, and TDY Spy. And they basically, TDY Spy is if you do, is if you were doing like script uh, and then piped it to like curl bash and we're sending that off to another thing. So anytime anyone logged into this machine, it just logged their entire console internet, like input and output and, and shipped it off. Uh, and because that was their entry point, even when they SSH'd into a, a different server, that recording still, uh, still, still happened and went through. Uh, and then uh, SSH agent would basically give them, ac it, was, it would fake an SSH agent and give them access to a key to SSH to another machine without actually letting them see or edit or change that key. Um, so it meant that once they, once, if, the SSH, if the Bastion knew about them and it knew what servers they were allowed to go to, it gave them the keys in their agent to get to those servers. And then from then on, you could have a shared, uh, a shared username amongst them uh, and all the auditing happened, right? The, we could see what individual user was doing what, uh, and we didn't have to do a ton of uh, crazy user management on every single server. And so I kind of touched on it earlier, but you can, um, you can also use stuff like Ansible hardening or your own Ansible roles along with KubeSpray. So KubeSpray will deploy Kubernetes for you with various networking components, uh, various amounts of hosts. It's very easy to set up your inventory and get going. And then you can actually apply uh, security hardening before and after um, to be able to prove to, the, to your security team that you have a deployment that's meeting certain standards. And so it's, uh, I think it's still in incubation status right now, but you can use this in production. It has upgrades built in, HA, all that kind of thing. Yeah, and so basically we, we took all of these parts and we stitched them together. And you run like three or four playbooks in a row and you basically end up with a, a Kubernetes infrastructure that has like all, most of the primitives, if not all of the primitives that your security team wants to see that you have. So, you know, you, you're, you run Cuddle initially to set up a bastion and you're logging and monitoring hosts. Then you, then you run uh, Cuddle again on your actual host that will be Kubernetes and that will set up the, like the, the, the users and stuff that you, want, you need. It'll set up the uh, Sensu client, Logstash client and all those bits and pieces interact, interact with Cuddle. And then you run uh, uh, KubeSpray to get Kubernetes running and then you run uh, security hardening and, it's, and hard, hardens it. And I actually did a bunch of experimentation with hardening and, and KubeSpray and found if I ran it before, if I ran hardening before, then ran KubeSpray, and then ran hardening again, it didn't change anything that second time. So I, was, I had a, a very high amount of confidence that the, the two playbooks weren't gonna fight with each other and like one set, one setting, one change it and kind of go like that. Uh, and so that was really cool. So I think you must have already worked on that um, to, to make that work, right? Yeah, we've done, um, we've handled a few bugs uh, within Ansible hardening to make sure that KubeSpray won't be affected. So basically that gave us a, a, a pretty secure infrastructure. The, the, the security team uh, was happy with it because it was the same set of tools that we'd both used uh, to do OpenStack that our security teams were happy with. Um, but we, didn't, we haven't really touched on how we secure stuff on top of Kubernetes uh, and that was kind of on purpose because we only have 25 minutes or whatever to talk. But you know, there's a lot of stuff still to consider. You know, what did your build pipeline look like? Where are you gonna be hosting your containers? Um, how do you make sure that the, the image you want is actually the image you built and you know, image scanning, um, all that sort of stuff, um, secret management, um, authentication to Kubernetes, are you gonna do like, you know, Kelsey was talking earlier, do you give each person or each group their own Kubernetes or do you wanna go down the, the, the RBAC route? Um, so tons of, tons of other considerations to, to still think about uh, and to work with the security team about. Um, but what we, what we found is that by going to the security team and bringing these tools to them, A, they weren't, they're they not necessarily familiar with the sort of tools we use in the, I guess, the DevOps space, right? Because uh, they have different cares and concerns. And so we bring these tools to them and we say, hey, we can help solve the problems that you're trying to solve using the tools that we, we know. 
And then, as Major said earlier, it becomes a, a discussion about the guardrails versus a can we know, can we know kind of conversation, which you know, no, nobody really enjoys. Like, we don't enjoy being told no. Security team usually doesn't enjoy saying no. And so you, know, you join the conversation together and you get you know, everyone involved in that uh, kind of DevOps mentality of like, let's just improve everything together. Some people would like to call that like DevSecOps and Sec DevOps and stuff, but really just DevOps itself is kind of describing that everyone working together to improve like the, what we're doing with the business, improve the culture and stuff like that. And with that, that's the end of the presentation. Uh, we thank everyone for coming. If you have questions, we've, we've got a little bit of time. So the question was, how are we handling the multi-factor for SSH? Yeah, so uh, you can do YubiKeys, and we have a little service that runs, uh, so it makes it syncs between the, if you have more than one bastion, and you, you, in the, your Ansible inventory, you have like the YubiKey ID and a couple other pieces of information per user. And every time you run Ansible, it just makes sure those are set. Uh, and then we also have, if you're using uh, the Google Authenticator, um, they, they have a, a PAM module, so it installs that PAM module. And again, you have like a, a Google Authenticator ID and a couple of other pieces of information um, that it needs. And it just runs that on every, drops that on every Bastion server. Um, and then, the SSH agent mux tool has a, a, a small little SQLite database that tracks uh, the users and what groups they have and gives them a, 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 a key based on what group they're in so that they can then get onto the other servers. Uh, two quick things. First, you mentioned Ansible Power. There is AWX, which is the upstream free version. This is the Um Second one, Ansible Hardening. Very good questions. Okay, so the first comment was around you can get Ansible Tower for free as AWX. So you can go download that today. And the second part was um, Ansible hardening, why it wasn't part of the mind point. So we originally had a discussion in the beginning. So our, our, our first foray was uh, into translating the STIG for Ubuntu. So that was the first thing we went to because the finding, well, there's now a STIG for Ubuntu. It still needs a little bit more work. It's getting there. Uh, but at the time, there was not one. And so all of our deployments internally at Rackspace were on Ubuntu, so we had to kind of translate that over to Ubuntu. So that's where we went first. And then we kind of came back to CentOS and Red Hat after that. And then it expanded to SUSE, and then Debian, and then Fedora. Uh, and we expand further. So the, I think the mind point one has been very focused on um, RHEL and CentOS, which totally makes sense, because it's what the STIG's designed for. Uh, but we had some different usage requirements. So we support all those OSs right now from the same repo. Yeah, that's right. Inspector is written in Ruby. Yeah, so um, we were using Service Spec initially, um, and then Inspect, Inspect came along, and it was a much stronger DSL. And the DSL is Ruby-ish, but you don't really need to know Ruby to do it unless you're going to start doing loops and stuff like that. Uh, and we didn't have any issues with uh, anyone from our security team learning enough to uh, to write write all of the rules for uh, Stig and then all of the other. Uh, IBM related compliance that we had to make sure we were having. Um, so it was, it was a, a little bit of a learning curve, but it was not a bar barrier to entry for anyone to actually work with it. And then Ansible has some options too for like uh, slurping config files and then asserting that certain things are in there yep. or maybe checking directories and things like that. So there's some, there's some auditing capabilities that you have there as well. Yeah, and we actually could have done it with Ansible, um, but we wanted to have a little bit of separation between the tool that writes the configs and the tool that checks the configs. Um, because I might have a bug, right, in Ansible that gets it wrong, and if it gets it wrong putting it down, it probably get it wrong checking it. And so that was why we specifically went for something that wasn't Ansible. And you know, from the five minutes I spent researching online, Inspect seemed to be the one to do. Anything else? About the, oh, the audit tools. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the question was around what are the audit tools that we're using. So, uh, we talked a little bit about using Ansible kind of as an auditing tool. It works okay for that. Um, 
and then, then we talked about inspect yeah. as, as another auditing tool. Of course, on the system itself, that you have audit D as well, so you can audit syscalls and things like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, security hardening turns audit D and some of those Linux auditing tools on by default. And if you've got a central log service, uh, and if you run Cuddle, it will set up uh, a log stash forwarder to send all of those logs to your Elk service or whatever your centralized log service is. And so that way, from verifying um, the side of things, you've got your monitoring is going to alert you as soon as something goes out of spec. And then you've got your, your Elk logs that actually say everything like everything that InSpec ran came up good or didn't at a particular time or date. And so we, we would just basically, um, at first we were just taking a screenshot of like log, logs and then eventually wrote some Elasticsearch queries to be a little bit smarter about that. And we were just dumping them to a file system so that they could give them to, like if someone said, oh, we need to check a server from this date, or, you know, or like a random spot check, which they would do, we could just, you know, just give them like a, a document that said everything's good rather than having to send them off to an Elasticsearch or Kibana dashboard. And so auditing can also be helpful. Uh, how many folks in here have used or tried SecComp at some point? All right, yeah, so all of us have gray hair from that experience. Um, so the, the scary part about SecComp is that you might actually block something that you need and then you have a container that's not working or an application that's not working. So one of the things I generally prefer to do is have Audit D audit the syscalls that I know are gonna be problematic for me that I might go and block with SecComp and have Audit D audit them for a while and trigger alerts on that. And then if I don't, you know, if we deploy an application and I don't see an alert on that syscall for a week, I'm like, okay, well then maybe we could add that and just remove that capability from the, not capability, sorry, remove that syscall from the container. So how do you manage SSH uh, key configuration? So it's not included. Uh, in here, because it's not included in Ansible hardening, I should say, because it's not a STIG requirement. Um, but you can use Ansible to do that as well. Ansible can actually place the new key and then tear the old one off right after. Yeah, so we, we had, we, we did exactly that with Cuddle, right? So you had a, like a list of all your users and their, their public keys, um, and it would drop them in. So when they're logging in, they would have their public key and their second factor. Uh, and then you can simply look at like the, the git change log and some other stuff to figure out if it's too old or not uh, and say, okay, everyone, time to, time to roll us up some new keys. And they would just make pull requests to, to the Ansible to say, here's my new key. And so we didn't have to, it, it was fairly self-service. I mean, they, they couldn't run Ansible because only a few people could run Ansible across the bastions. Um, but anyone could at any point update their key and say, hey, can you just roll the playbook for me so my new key shows up. Uh, and then the same across all of the servers. So we had basically one or two access keys for all of our servers being managed by Cuddle because we had the RBAC at the bastion. And so it was a very simple drop down some new, new keys in the bastion, put the public keys and authorized uh, files um, on, the, uh, on every other server, and just run Ansible. And it would just like, run it all out everywhere. Uh, and you know, depending on how many servers we were doing it on, it would take like five minutes to 20, 30 minutes. Yeah, make sure you always add the new key first before you remove yeah. the old one. It seems like that would be self-explanatory. It's not always. <laughs> All right, anything else? Uh oh. <laughs> um, kind of a follow-up to the SSH key question. SSH keys are dumb and you shouldn't be using them. So would you be open to contributions to put rewards using SSH certificates within this infrastructure? Okay, so the comment was uh, using SSH keys is kind of the, the old way. And then we've got 509 should get support, and why don't we use that? Or 509 ish, sorry, yeah. We have to be specific. Um, I would definitely be up for it. I just think some of the challenges I've seen in the past were like you, you got to make sure your revocation's on point and all that kind of stuff. I know there's some technology to help with that. Yep. But uh, our, our repo for Cuddle is open source, and we have the links in the slides, which will be up on the thing. So if someone wants to contribute that, we would be happy to take it. All right. All right. Anything else? Thank you all very much. Yeah, thanks all for coming.